this letter is stained with my blood. The University Greys, or Company A of the 11th Mississippi Infantry Regiment, was nearly entirely comprised of students and faculty from the University of Mississippi. So many had in fact enlisted that the school was unable to open its doors in 1861 with only five students enrolling. These young men fought gallantly throughout the war, and their losses were many but none are remembered more vividly in my recollections than that of their efforts at Gettysburg. During Pickett's charge up Cemetery Ridge, they pushed farther into enemy lines than any other company and were rewarded for their efforts with a 100% casualty rate, with every man of the company being killed or wounded. As the battle there progressed, I went up to my little first aid hospital behind the barn road embankment and under its cover I seated myself for business. Presently the wounded began to come in crouching me, for many were killed and wounded before the charge began. The first to arrive, born on a litter, was a princely fellow and favored son of the 11th Mississippi. I saw in an instant a condition of terrible shock. Keeping everybody close to the ground, I turned him and he pointed to his left arm. I quickly exposed it and found that a cannonball had nearly torn it away between the elbow and the shoulder. I made some encouraging remark when he smiled and said, Why, doctor, that is nothing. Here is where I am really hurt. And he laid back the blanket and exposed the lower abdomen, torn from left to right by a cannon shot largely carrying away the bladder, much intestine, and a third of the right half of the pelvis, but in both wounds so grinding and twisting the tissues that there was no hemorrhage. I then surveyed his personality, observing the tender devotion on the part of his litter bearers, and I saw a singularly attractive creature. Through his deathly pallor, I could detect a sunburned blonde who in health would show a strong and ruddy countenance. A large head with a tussled shock of reddish golden locks like a mane with the musculature and form of an athlete. Deferentially polite, there was something singularly self-confident and manly about him. Without the slightest change of voice, he asked, Doctor, How long have I to live? A very few hours, I replied. Doctor, I am in great agony. Let me die easy, dear doctor. I would do the same for you. His soul peered from the depths of his blue eyes in an appeal of anguish that cut me to the heart, and I replied, You, dear noble fellow, I will see to it that you shall die easy. No word or detail of this scene has faded from my memory. There was no thought of the dramatic. It was dreadfully genuine and naturally spontaneous in the unconscious creating and acting of a grander tragedy than we might ever hope to play. I called for and my hospital knapsack bearer, Jim Rao, quickly handed me a two ounce bottle of black drop, a concentrated solution of opium much stronger than laudanum. I poured a tablespoon of it into a tin cup with a little water and offered it, but before his hand could reach it a thought flashed into my mind, and withdrawing the cup I asked, Have you no message to leave? It startled him, and in a low moaning wail he cried, 
My mother, oh my darling mother, how could I have forgotten you? Quick, I want to write. By that time, all who were crouching under the low shelter were crowded around, oblivious of their own injuries and weeping silently. I took my seat on the ground close beside him and lifted him over, reclining on my chest, his face close to mine, to steady his head, his right elbow in the hollow of my right hand to support and steady his arm, and a pencil slipped into his hand. Jim Rowell had provided the sheet of paper held on the smooth lid of the hospital knapsack improvised as a desk. He wrote rapidly. All of this transpired in haste, murmuring to himself the words audible to me for I looked the other way. He began with the place and the date. On the battlefield, July 3rd, 1863. My dear mother, this is the last you may ever hear from me. I have time to tell you that I have died like a man. Remember that I am true to my country and my greatest regret at dying is that she is not free and that you and my sisters are robbed of my worth, whatever that may be. I hope this will reach you and you must not regret that my body cannot be obtained. It is a mere matter of form anyhow. This is for my sisters too, as I cannot write more. Send my dying release to Miss Mary. You know who. J.S. Gage, Company A, 11th Mississippi. This letter is stained with my blood. He wrote little more than half a page into which he poured with vehemence his whole soul of tenderest love never faltering for a word and a message towards the last with a name that he wrote silently, conscious of the presence of strangers, but the message was too personal and sacred to him for me to trespass, for it was holy ground. The last line he softly repeated aloud. I dipped this letter in my dying blood. With that, he turned down the blanket and seizing the letter, pressed the back of it into his oozing bloody wound and handed it to me, giving his mother's address and begging to be sure she got that letter. I rose from the ground and had him supported when he turned to me with a reminder of my promise and of his hopeless pain. I handed him the cup and he feebly waved it, saying, Come around, boys, and let us have a toast. I do not invite you to drink with me, but I drink the toast to you and to the Southern Confederacy. We laid him back on some improvised soft headrest, and I rushed off to work amongst the wounded. But from Virginia, I saw that his mother got the letter, its content unrevealed except to herself. If you'd like to learn more about Private Jeremiah Gage, the 11th Mississippi, or the University Grays, the links to all of the reference material are in the video description below. And if you enjoyed today's video, be sure to take a shot at the like button, subscribe, and ring that notification bell to stay up to date with the latest bird dog content.